Welcome everybody here to Pier 70. We're uh, in honor of Pride Week. We're continuing our conversations in the weigh-in series uh, that Uber Freight has with drivers throughout the industry. So first off, we're gonna have everybody introduce themselves and we'll start off over here. Hi, uh, my name is Elio Dare. Uh, I'm a truck driver for Jim Palmer Trucking. I haul refrigerated cargo, mostly foodstuffs across the lower 48. Um, I've been driving for about two years. Uh, I am trans and I've got a, a small YouTube channel where I just kind of show, try to show people what life is like every day on the road and the kind of amazing places that we get to go every day. Hi, I'm Kiara Finlay. Um, I'm a trucker for Celadon Driving, or Celadon Trucking. Um, I haul automotive parts for Ford. Uh, I've been driving for about four years. I don't have a, a YouTube channel or anything like that, but I do uh, CG modeling uh, for fun. Um, I worked on Renegades, the Requiem, so all kinds of weird things like that. Hi, I'm Ann Bailey. I drove a truck very briefly in 2015. I had been laid off and I didn't have a job and I decided to try it. And I didn't keep the job for very long. I was laid off after five months. But I met enough people when I was out there to get curious and fascinated by the industry. And so I've written a book called Semi-Queer that's going to be published this September that tells the stories of gay, lesbian, trans, black, indigenous, and immigrant truckers. So I'm here to talk about that. I'm Shelley Lichty. I'm the founder of LGBT Truckers. I've been trucking legally for 25 years and with Hirschbach Motor Lines for just over 10. Uh, a huge advocate within the trucking industry, trying to correct the abuses that affect the drivers in everyday life and making their lives easy. Hi, I'm Bobby Lloyd. And um, currently right now, I am driving with Great, Lake, Great Lakes Cold Logistics. Um, I'm a team driver with my husband, and uh, we've been together for 10 years, so if we can live together on a truck, we can definitely survive another 10 years or more. Um, and, and we basically haul um, from coast to coast, about 6,000 miles a week. So. Uh, I'm Ricky Coffey, and he pretty much has playing all of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, kind, I'm curious, uh, how each of you came to trucking. And, you know, and also in that, you know, as uh, how gender and affects that and, and, and the like. So let, let's, let's start with you. Okay. Well, um, we came to trucking basically, um, we was working for the American Red Cross and uh, we were basically traveling two and three states just passing each other all the time. Um, using personal vehicles and uh, literally we we weren't DOT regulated so therefore we weren't you know we were walking 24 7 on call yeah uh, we'll in no sleep and nothing like so that. I kind of came up with the idea I was like you know both of our dads his dad had a trucking company my dad was a trucker uh, we grew up around it so we decided to go to school together and just do the whole experience together so that's kind of how it started for us so Shelly, you were saying something about uh, well, the question of legality of when you began. <laughs> Can you fill us in on that a little bit? Well, if we want to get technical, I started driving a truck. I taught myself to drive when I was about 14 uh, to escape my current conditions by, and I was hitching, trucker, hitching rides with truckers and in order to stay safe, I taught myself how to drive a truck. and didn't get my CDL though until I was close to 22, uh, but I've been on the road full time since I was 16. So I wow. used to hire myself for a few days. <laughs> yes. And so we, you drove for like five months? Yes. And uh, so what were you driving at that point? What was, uh, it was, I think you were saying you were hauling between Minnesota uh, and Mississippi that's right. mostly. Okay. I drove for rail, which is based in Wisconsin. And mostly I went from Kimberly Clark in Minnesota down to Mississippi to get paper pulp and back. And then I drove recycled tubes of paper and other just fascinating. <laughs> Life of a trucker. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I got into trucking because of uh, 
I'd, I'd spent most of my time working in factories, um, and I got tired of that. I actually had a panic attack at the last factory I worked at and got fired for that. So I kept seeing ads for uh, truck drivers wanted. And, you know, it was always truck drivers wanted, and the page would be full of them. So I said, you know, what the hell? Got nothing better to do, nothing to lose. So I went for it and finally got my CDL, uh, which was an ordeal because I had other things going on at the same time. Did you go to a training company or? Yeah, I went. You know, Celadon actually had its own school at that point. Um, but uh, that was the second school I went to. The first one um, I went to, I actually left because I got kissed by the instructor. And I thought that was very unprofessional. But the second one, I had the best experience I'd ever had in school, ever. Excellent. Um, so Ellie? I had kind of an unusual route to this industry. Uh, I have a bachelor's of science in weather forecasting. I graduated in 2011 and I transitioned the year I graduated. And I did not think about it at the time, but no, no TV station in the country is going to hire a transgender weather girl. Um, so I, I was working dead end retail jobs in my hometown, and I was playing trucking video games for fun. Taught myself how to back a trailer in a, in games, and uh, was trying to figure out how way stations worked in one of them, and wound up stumbling onto Allie Knight's YouTube channel and talking to her on Twitter, and it's like, oh, this is a job that women can actually do. Like, there's lots of women that drive truck. I didn't realize that before that. And uh, so I wound up looking for training companies, and uh, Allie talked me out of going to one of the less reputable ones, and I went, ended up going to Jim Palmer Trucking, the same company she was with. And I learned how to drive and been with them ever since. So you're chasing Allie's uh, record of uh, how many states she visited, right? She beat me to the full 48. Uh, okay. I still haven't hit Rhode Island or Maine, but I've been to all the other 46 okay, okay. lower so, states. So you're on her heels, okay. <laughs> so. Um, So uh, here's the next question here is, uh, what has been your experience in freight as an LBGTQ plus person? And I'll let you start here. As far as driving? Yeah, just, that's a kind of a general question. You can riff on it how you, you know. Um, well, I've had kind of a mixed bag. Um, when I came out at work at a factory, I went from being the most popular technician there to being the most hated person on the planet in about five minutes. Um, so they did not make it uh, you know, very nice for me to work there. But I toughed it out as long as I could. Um, as far as trucking goes, I've had no real problems you know, based on who I am. Uh, I see that, that the most uh, problems we get is mostly online from keyboard heroes. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be where most of the hate is because gen uh, truckers generally tend to keep to themselves. Um, so it, I haven't had too bad of a time with it. Okay, we're going to jump over here. Here, Jim Shelley, what, what's your answer to that question? <sighs> Uh, that's kind of a weighty one because back in the day, it used to be really difficult for lady truckers out on the road. So this is a multifaceted deal, not only the LGBTQ aspect of things, but as far as female truck truckers in general. Throwing the two together, I'm supposed to be the stereotype uh, of my flannel shirt, combat boots, uh, wooly bully hair, you know, uh, a lady driver, you hear, well, you don't look like a trucker. What am I supposed to look like? Well, you don't, you know, are you gay? Depending on the level I know you, then I might tell you, but when I did come out and was more prevalent, they were like, oh, of course you're gay. If you're a lady driver out here, you've got to be a gay trucker. So, you know, uh, and there were the, there are the abuses both as a female uh, and have incurred some of I haven't met the right uh, appendage, um, you know, being thrown against the truck, brutalized, uh, discontent from companies, you know, like she had said, being the you know being the great driver, 
to all of a sudden, you know, I'm not being productive enough. Do you think that there's been a shift in, you know, since, because you've been in the industry quite a while, do you think there's been a shift in things or is it still? I actually believe the environment is changing because the culture is evolving. Um, I believe that the LGBT community, because, you know, you can't tell by appearance who is what. And this is an image that it could be any color, any facet, and the trucking industry is starting to catch up. Um, that it doesn't matter your orientation to get the job done. Right. It's that person at the wheel who means the most. If you get the if you get the load there on time, it's the most important. Don't thing. bounce up with anything yeah, and make exactly. it on time. Exactly. You're next. Um, I do agree with everything that everybody has said, but from a male standpoint, it changes a little bit. Um, you know, things have come so much more, and I see so much more diversity in truckers and everybody that's out there. But um, it's not as friendly to us. You know, we can be sitting in the front seat and um, we pull up to a truck stop and everybody instantly, you know, grabs that mic and derogatory comments comes across the radio, um, singling us out. Um, and I've got a mouth, so I get right back on there <laughs> and tell them how it is too. So, but, um, you know, we, we see that every day. But for, fortunately for us, you know, we, we really don't, we don't stop. So with the team, you know, we're running 6,000 miles a week. So we run from Boston to Los Angeles, and we do that twice a week. So you, you can't find us where we're at unless you're on the road passing us or something, or call me on my cell phone. That's the only way to remember where we're at. So, I mean, but we get the comments, even just driving down the highway and someone passes you, which very few people pass us because we go about 73, 75 on the highway, and we want other trucks. So, so you guys are hammered down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. Anything to add? No, not really. I think my sense it all up. <laughs> I guess he, so we'll go to Ellie. Well, um, I drove in blissful uh, unawareness of radio comments for the first year. I didn't even have a CB radio. Then I got one and discovered that uh, CB radio is kind of like the internet of truck driving. People suddenly become emboldened to discuss all of their bigotries on the radio. Um, just like Twitter. But uh, it's. For the most part, I don't get harassed by other drivers in, in situations like bathroom situations. Uh, it's situations where I have to interact with other uh, automobile drivers, particularly families, uh, get kind of defensive if they've got kids around and they see me use a bathroom. Uh, that can cause problems. But for the most part, you get left alone in the truck stops and then rest areas can be a little bit dicey sometimes. So you're saying within the industry is a lot easier than? Mm -hmm. It's a very live and let live industry uh, for the most part. You get the job done and you're in a company that's supportive, the other drivers, everyone's focused on driving their own equipment for the most part. So as long as you don't run into them, they're pretty, pretty okay with you for the most part, in my experience. So Anne, with all of the, I know you've done a, like a lot of ride-alongs with drivers and stuff and done, you know, met an awful lot of people. What is the, you know, your take on the same question? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, there has always been a different attitude about sexuality among working class communities than there is among middle class communities. So it used to be that um, what we now consider gay and lesbian behavior was defined as working class and was really common all over the place. And then around 1970, when the gay movement arose right around here, um, what happened is tolerance got marked as middle class and therefore a bigotry got marked as working class. And a lot of what happens in truck stops is an effect of that. But that's not what's actually happening. That's just how people portray themselves. So middle class people really like to think that they're tolerant and accepting. But that doesn't make them nice to careers at work. It doesn't make them tolerant at work. So the amount of acceptance among truckers is way higher than I thought it would be. So it's hardest for men, and it's hardest for trans women. Trans men can hide. It's very hard for non-white truckers. So there's a lot of variety, but there's also a lot of acceptance. I mean, there's so many trans women truckers because they can get hired. If you get your butt in the seat and get from point A to point B, 
That's all you need to do. But there are also a lot of dangers, like out at shippers and receivers, at fuel stops. There's a lot of danger that happens. So it's a kind of complicated situation. Well, I, I think that you know, truck stops in general can be a little dicey for practically anybody, depending on where you are. But I can, it, it's amplified, is what you're saying. Oh, totally amplified. I mean, most women that I interviewed had been raped. Mm -hmm. And that's cis or trans women. Most had been raped. It's just considered part of the job. And that's just expect it in a kind of a way. Okay, so I got a truck driving question. Automatic or a stick? You know, you want to, would you rather drive one, uh, you know, the new automatic transmissions or do you want to shift gears? Is there an age limit on that one? Huh? I said, is there an age limit on that one? Well, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends on the truck brand for me. Uh, I like the Freightliner automatic transmission. I'm not a fan of the Peterbilt or uh, Kenworth ones. Um, those are the only brands I've had experience with myself, but uh, I'm also perfectly happy with a 10-speed. Okay. And, and so what type of truck do you like to drive? Uh, Freightliner, Kathy. Uh, okay. I'm very tall. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we are. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I will not touch an automatic. I had, I've driven three of them, and they've all broken on me. Uh, some would say it's probably me, but I disagree. <laughs> Uh, but I will go for stick every time. I have more control over what the vehicle does, especially going downhill. Um, but, uh, and backing up, a lot of the automatics are set to where when you back up and give it a little bit of, of gas, it wants to kind of hang there and then shoot back. Yeah, that's, um, that's why I was talking, that's the, what the Peterbilt and the uh, Kenworth ones do that I was talking about. Was the I've had a Freightliner do that too. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, and so you don't, you know, gently bump the dog, you slam into it. No, don't want to do that. But my choice would probably be a Peterbilt or a Kenworth. There we are. You're a pack car. Yeah, okay. And? I like a stick. I mean, it's fun. Driving should yeah. be fun. You can't be a gear jammer without jamming the gears. <laughs> okay, that's you know. But then again, we are in a time where um, the largest, you know, the predominant market has never drove a manual transmission. Right. So a lot of fleets are changing over to automatic trucks. Now, me, I'm I'm part of the you know folks that are starting to fall apart, and after 30 years of using a clutch, uh, I now have to do an automatic. Oh, okay. Um, so I went, you, I, now I see what you were alluding to. Okay. Yes, once you once you get to the old fart club, then yeah, you got to move on to the automatics. Um, but no, I went from a twenty one mm -hmm. double stick, good old days, reaching through the steering wheel right. shifting, yeah. to where I've embraced a lot of the evolutions of technology mm -hmm. in transportation. You know, from you know having a cruise control and air ride seats instead of twisting down the throttle riding on a milk crate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and actually for me, uh, it would be a stick as well. It's pretty much the same exact reasons, you know, the, the backing up. Um, I, I completely felt unsafe and automatic. I mean, it would just do those like charge thing, backing up. And, and you can't, as fast as you guys drive across the country, you can't be doing much backing up though, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we do when we stop, but you know, I, even though I'm driving five hours sometimes in LA traffic, I still shift all those gears before going on. Uh, I would prefer a 10 speed also. The automatic is great for traffic jams, but other than that, 10 speed. So we kind of have a, uh, a, a like a a technology uh, bent going a little bit towards the uh, the old tried and true, right? Mm -hmm. so, do you see any like new technologies and how it might be, you know, changing the, the world of uh, trucking, you know, like for instance, um, how, um, uh, you know, for instance, Uber Freight has a, an app. So a, you know, does that change uh, how, or do you see that could change the way um, people would interact at uh, shipping docks or, or how loads are um, uh, doled out to drivers, you know, or dispatched, or is that? I mean, absolutely. Uh, the, the more you can app-based trucking 
there's so many things that don't need to be on paper. Uh, bills of lading. There's no reason that we should be, I mean, a lot of truckers still scan them into a, a kind of fax machine sort of deal. Uh, my company, we've got an app, we just take photos of the bills on, on the phone. Uh, for scale tickets, I don't even get them printed out anymore, it's all digital. Right. Um, just cutting that out, there's no reason for it to be as far behind as it is. And everything you do to get paperwork out of trucking makes things faster, makes everything able to happen on a better time scale. It also makes it neater because if you've seen some of our handwriting, <laughs> then you notice, you'll know that, you know, uh, some of our handwriting could be totally illegible. Um, and also, you know, when you get out of the truck, you could have a bill of lading blow out the window. I've had that happen. So, yeah. Uh, going paperless, or, or it goes out and it's in the rain. Yeah, right? you, go get you, have to, a, uh, you have to walk from you know the other end of the yard to, to the truck with the bill right. of lading. Do you stuff it in your jacket or right. hide it under your hat? So, and it makes it more gender neutral. And yeah, that's what I was wondering. Right, like I, I, they, I was having a hard time phrasing the question, but then you put no your, one who has a head. load is like, I don't really want to give this to the guy with the turban, or I don't want to give it to the trans person. Like it's just a neutral technology, and it doesn't have biases. So. Yeah, so it's democratic and taking that out. Yeah. yeah. For me, I embrace the technologies that are utilized to communicate directly with the fleets or the brokerage firms. Shippers and receivers, um, I'd rather have the documentation because I'm old school. I need that visual, physical backup to make you, I, I have it there, I can make you pay me for it. Okay. Digital gets lost. I got that documentation to back it up. For me, I think it's more like an easy access it makes it a lot easier the more digital things are. Um, I'm a little bit more easy side of our team because I don't do any of the paperwork to keep track of all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, but I think the less paperwork is better. I agree, less paperwork be better because like he said, I'm the one that on the paperwork <laughs> every week to turn into our company, so it's just a hassle to do everything. There's a, another aspect of digitizing making it easier is Sometimes it's really difficult to get shippers and receivers to sign the bills in the right spot. <laughs> which you wouldn't think would be a difficult thing to get to, but just getting them to acknowledge that your truck got there with the doors locked and sealed can be like, it's like pulling teeth sometimes. And digitizing that, you get them to sign a little pad on, on a desk and the computer puts the signature in the right spot. Uh, there we go. And from an environmental point of view, that's yeah. a lot of trees you can save. Yeah. Yeah, there are some shippers out there that you know, small little forests are made to, are decimated to create our paperwork. Uh, you know, rather than two sheets, you get a whole stack or a book. And you also can have them because some of the times, you know, you show up and you're not like the new There's always confusion between the, the broker, the shipper, everybody back and forth. Like, you'll have load numbers that it doesn't even match anything else that you want, and they're wanting like a two, three number, and all you have is like seven, seven, something. You know, so that's a lot of the time, and I think that that brings down some of the confusion and the loss, you know, connection between them. So, what kind of advice would you give to other LGBTQ professionals in the industry and those that would like to enter the industry? Kira, you first. <laughs> uh, first, the, the jobs are available. A lot of companies are very friendly uh, to LGBTQ uh, drivers. Um, and a lot of the problems that you know, plague the industry are slowly uh, leaving. Um, but uh, you know, it, I enjoy it more than I ever did factory work. I wish I'd gotten into trucking before because I'm sorry to say, but you guys have a great job, but I have the best office window. <laughs> Far not. I got you beat. So. Um, for me, for regardless of sexuality, obtaining a CDL, you're never without work. If you want to work, you have a job without a doubt. Now, how well you perform that job is completely up to you. You have to be a self-motivator, be able to react quickly to situations. Um, you know, know how to micromanage your time and be efficient, mm -hmm. uh, as, along with representing, you know, yourself and your fleet. 
But as far as the LGBTQ community, I feel that trucking gives them the opportunity to explore their inner self. You're left for hours on end with nothing but time to think. And as we evolve and become in touch with ourselves, we have the opportunity to recreate ourselves. You may have come from a really bad background and have dealt with depression, other mental illnesses, and through, trans through trucking, you get a new perspective on who you are. You get to focus on you, not you, but you. Mm -hmm. And you can create the identity of the person that you want to be. Yeah, well said. Um, I personally think, you know, uh, sitting in that truck and going on the road, you know, the miles can be so loud, if that makes any sense. Like, you really get a full clarity on your life, and you can reflect on so many things that you've done, and be like, why did I do those things? Um, and for, you know, the LGBT community, you know, we have so many things that we deal with over our whole entire life. And it, for me, it gave me a lot of, um, I mean, I've done everything from pageants to modeling when I was a kid, and you know, so just like, I was like, what was I doing? What was I focusing on? Where was I trying to get to? And I think I finally, for me personally, got to a place that's just the best office window and the clearest in my life I've ever be. It's very simplicity. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I said, like she said, uh, you get the best office friend there, like he says that also, but, you know, you get to see so many places and everything, you feel free, just driving down the road, so I mean, it's a really great job, and you get to see a lot of places you've never seen before, so, I mean, it's an adventure, but you know, you got to try to protect yourself on the road also. Yeah, you make a lot of sacrifices, but you can gain so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say choose your training company very carefully. So, and that goes back to something you said, Ellie. Um, being well trained is crucial to succeeding in trucking. Trucking can be an excellent job, especially for queer and trans people, but you have to be trained so you know what you're doing. And a lot of companies now do some very minimal training, let truckers go out there and they wind up crashing or making mistakes. And it's, so choosing a company very carefully before you sign up is really important. But if you can get past the initial training phase, yeah. there is, I feel like there's an important link between sexual exploration, like Shelley was saying, and the process of being a trucker. There's something about getting out there and seeing stuff and meeting people and seeing kind of the back end of what makes the country work that lets you discover who you are and feel at home in your body and your world and confident, like you can do this amazing thing so you, you build confidence in yourself. There's a really good kind of fit that happens there if you have good training that can really totally work out for so many people that I know. Uh on much the same, the same point, it's all about the company you pick. You've got to make sure you don't get involved with, some companies will put you into predatory leases right off the bat after you finish training. Um, other companies may not be trans or uh, LGBT friendly at all. Uh, so it's really about picking the right company to start with and then not letting yourself get into a massive amount of debt right at the start. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of trans people go into this job in particular with not a lot of money. Uh, a lot of us are living below the poverty line, uh, especially before we get into a job like trucking. Trucking is a one-way ticket to the middle class still for us. It's not necessarily that for most of the rest of the country, but for trans people it can be. Um, but you just got to make sure you don't get stuck in a situation where the truck becomes a portable closet and you're still stuck in it the entire time. So, uh, Shelley alluded to, you know, spending a lot of time with yourself. Um, what about community and on the road and, you know, or, and the broader thing, you know, uh, you know, time off and, and the like. 
You know, you do make a lot of sacrifices as a full-time over-the-road truck driver, which is what I am. I generally stay out for about six to eight weeks at a time and then take a week off. You sacrifice a lot, um, but thank goodness for technologies because mm -hmm. the days of sitting in a truck stop in a room of full of stinky truckers fighting for one phone <laughs> are over. Um, so technology has definitely helped revol revolutionize our contact to stay in touch with our families and loved ones. Social media platforms, because the CB is, is basically you know, obsolete for the most part, unless you're at a shipper receiver and they're trying to tell you what door to wait for. Um, we're utilizing social media big time. Drivers were a big driving force on that too. And I don't, you know, a lot of the technologies the transportation was, you know, the, uh, the fertile feeding ground to, to launch a lot of these yep. things. Yep. And a lot of the older ones are, and a lot of the older drivers are still kind of stuck in the basic cell phones, but they acknowledge that cell phones were the greatest thing ever created for us. Mm -hmm. That quick contact to stay connected because you can be become very disconnected in our occupation. Yeah. Um, personally for me, kind of hits home for me a little bit just because being on the road, you know, within the first year, um, I lost two really close people in my family and I was across the country mm -hmm. in California. So I didn't get to attend funerals or really say goodbye. Um, so that was just something that hit me really hard. You know, um, it's a part of trucking. It's a part of the sacrifice you made. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, I say goodbye in my own way. And then, um, but for me, him being on the road, you know, we like to work hard. We stay out about four weeks, though, because we like to play hard, too. So we're always at amusement parks or Disney or the beach because it's a couple miles from the house. And, you know, we, we, we play a lot, actually, way more than we should. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to want to leave the house. Yeah, Make we never, up for that time. time. <laughs> I mean, pretty much he summed it up, like, summed up on that, too, like, you know, a lot of things, but, uh, <laughs> He's spoiled. I mean, he's <laughs> spoiled. Our minds are blank, so. Our whole house is digital. Everything we do, we just, we're, we're like, you know, just the spoiled nerds kind of thing. Uh -huh. And so we spend our life on the road, and then I'm literally, like, Amazon or whatever, just ordering stuff all the time. And, like, it shows up when I'm home, and I have all these packages. So it's there like, we are. <laughs> Christmas Go home to Christmas. Time. Yeah. But Ann, what do you think? One thing we haven't talked about is the danger of the job. It's a really dangerous job. Um, and so living with that level of anxiety and stress and fear is a crucial part of what sets the job apart from other jobs. I mean, it's mm -hmm. one of the top two most dangerous jobs. So, mm -hmm. and that's for anybody. And then if you add all of the dangers that or risk factors that follow being queer, like, you know, family rejection, high rates of chemical dependency that are related to that. I mean, mm -hmm. being a true trucker is, you're living with a lot of fear all the time. And so for that, community is so important. Yeah, yes. To sort of have a sense that there are other people who are living through a similar situation and that someone cares and that someone sees you and community is, what makes living with that fear acceptable in some way. I'm going to jump to Ellie this time and try to mix oh, things up. Um, for trans people, it's not necessarily always a huge sacrifice to be away from your family. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm one of the few where my family stayed relatively supportive, but they still, it was awkward. So getting out of my hometown was definitely a good thing for me. And this job let me do that. Uh, also, I realized very early on in this career that Paying for a hotel three nights a month is a lot cheaper than paying rent. Because <laughs> you can, uh, one of the first things I did when trucking is I just needed to decompress after uh, my training period. Spent uh, eight weeks in a truck with another woman, um, seeing her constantly the entire time we were training. And I'm not a people person. <laughs> so uh, I needed a few days to decompress. A bit too much that. community, you're saying? And, yeah. Uh, I just took three days off uh, on the side of the Columbia River in uh, eastern, southeastern Washington. And it's just this amazingly beautiful place, and there's this little tiny motel there, and it was 50 bucks a night. And I could take a walk down by the river every day and just not care about anything. And it was 
incredible. And that's not the sort of thing you can do with any other job, just be there. I didn't have to pay for an airline ticket or a bus ticket or anything, I was just there. And also, um, trucking let me, I was there for the birth of my nephew, which I wouldn't have been able to do with any other job in, on the East Coast. My sister lives in South Dakota. And when we found out my sister was in labor, they kept me in the area uh, around uh, Eastern Montana, uh, Eastern Wyoming. And uh, I was in Cheyenne, got the call, like, it's tomorrow, be here. And they had me there overnight. Love it. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. What do you think here? Yeah, trucking is a mixed bag. Um, like driving team, it, you're in a box that's smaller than a prison cell. So, you know, it can be really stressful. So you gotta have a way to decompress. So like when I drove team for nine months, uh, I would take my home time and he would go, my uh, teammate would go off somewhere to uh, you know, do a run. And then he'd come back, pick me up, and then he would go on home time down in South Carolina. And I would do loads. Um, but uh, with the sacrifices, yeah, I've, I've missed Christmases, I've missed birthdays. Uh, my wife passed away while I was down in Texas delivering a load of Coca-Cola. Mm. So it took me uh, three or four days to get back home. Um, so, yeah, it's, it can be rough, but if you're a single person, then you can save a fortune on rent, uh, electric, cable, you know, all these bills. Mm -hmm. And you can just save up for whatever you want. You know, maybe you want to transition Maybe you want that go on that dream cruise. Um, you know, maybe you just want to save up for Christmas. So, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that you can't do in a nine to five job of working in a factory or at a desk job. So, well, so then we could just call off at any time if we don't feel like going to work that day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, here's a question about community. Is, it, do you, is there like a, um, you know, in an, an, an LGBT community of truck drivers, or do you, is there the broader community that that you know provide support too? Is it you know is there a difference? Is there a need for both? I know you've got opinion about that. <laughs> I'm I'm sweetness and over here. Um, you know, in my opinion. The personal contacts are going to be their best networking at this point. Um, there is very little out there for the LGBTQ truckers aside from a couple of social media platforms. Okay, so, so social media is really social good. media is going to be their mainstay unless they have that personal networking. Uh, you know, very close friends and family that are supportive of, of them. If they're not getting that support out there, then there are other resources. They're just very minimal mm -hmm. for the transportation industry. And there is only one that actually has the established network for do you, them. Do you think when you say there's a minimal, do you think that's just for truck drivers in general and especially? You know, there's actually programs for almost anything you could think of in transportation. Uh -huh. um, and it wasn't, you know, until recent years that there was something for, uh, for the LGBT trucking community. And there was that need and it was filled. Dylan? Um, well, you know, this is kind of how I found Shelby. You know, uh, we belong to LGBT truckers and uh, she was kind of my base, someone to talk to about things. I don't really feel there is um, that much of a presence yet. You know, it needs to be out there more, um, which is kind of what this is. And, um, but I'm, I like the direction everything is going in. And, um, you know, so Shelly's just been kind of my like go to person with everything. She's my, you know, I'm backing up or I'm trying to stay awake at 2 a.m. She's, she's just the person to talk to for all the time. And we get kind of slap happy and crazy. And, Two o'clock in the morning, but it's okay. Like, you add 4,000 of those uh -huh. <laughs> on through social media, oh, yeah. well, it can be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, truckers are lone wolf isolated people, right? Yes. Like that, yes. that's just kind of 
those are the people that are drawn to trucking, whether they're queer or trans or what. what? So, Do you think it's, it's drawn or successful at it? Both. Do you think I mean, people, some people are like, there seems to be a lot, a very high turnover of new drivers. Do you think that it takes a while to learn or to understand what it takes to, to do it? Oh, so the that, high that you have to be comfortable with yourself? Because of a training problem. Huh? The high turnover of drivers is because of training. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So if, if the company that trains you gets um, paid to train you in whatever manner and then wants to get paid to train someone else, right? Like they train people to work for them for decades, they train people to train more people. Okay. So that accounts for the turnover. More so than so it's, it's the amount of seats that they fill in the short run rather than right. the long, yeah. you know, creating a, a really top flight professional driver. Yeah, I mean, I love trucking and I love everything having to do with it. And if you want to know what needs to be fixed, it's training. Ah, interesting. Training needs to be overhauled in order for trucking to be a successful career for anyone who isn't already doing well in it. Um, but. But there is a personality that, you know, when you're a kid and you see the truck and you're like, I want that. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the people who are like popular and doing great at school, right? Like, <laughs> they're just not. They're people who like to be alone and like to think and. The last so, modern cowboy. Yeah, <laughs> so there is a personality trait. And, and that is also frequently, you know, queer, right? Mm -hmm. So because things are bumpy in school and things are bumpy with your family and so you want to kind of get away from all that. Mm -hmm. So since, since that's a personality trend that queer and trans people have and a personality trend that truckers have, it's sort of doubled right. in our okay. community. So, yeah. But we still need support and to know that we're not alone. So right. it's, you know, it's like you say, it's kind of a two things going on and you have to kind of navigate between them. Both understand that you... It takes a special kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so community is important, but also yeah. acknowledging the kind of cowboy mentality. Of right. It. Yeah. I see you're over there itching. You were over there itching to yeah. say something um, earlier. I, I've done my best with the company that I'm with now because I've gotten a little bit of publicity as being a successful trans truck driver. Um, so other trans people are coming to the same company that I work with now, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm there as a backbone of support that these other people can turn to when they need it. Because uh, our trainers are great, but there are no trans trainers at my company, and I'm not enough of a people person to do that myself again. Um, but them knowing that they can call me, like, I've got an alarmingly thorough knowledge of where there are gender neutral or just remote bathrooms that are relatively safe across the entire Midwest. Oh, uh, so I've, I've done that for other drivers like no you can go here there's a like there's way stations sometimes they'll just leave a bathroom unlocked and you can go park in this way station while it's closed and they've got gender neutral bathroom hidden around the back right. and that's something a lot of truckers never find right? and being able to just share that with other, other I think people. you just let that secret out <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't, I didn't know about it I, actually I do try to publicize the, the ones that I really like uh, as much as I can through social media again uh -huh. being a huge part of that but uh, every every trans driver I know in my company has my phone number. Uh. I've trained one driver who was also trans, and uh, I kept seeing him uh, get a job, lose a job, get a job, lose a job. And finally I said, look, why don't you just go into trucking? And I, they thought about it and said, yeah, that'd be a great idea. And I said, uh, yeah, you do that. And if you go to the Celadon school, I'll be your trainer after that. And I didn't actually think he would take me up on it. <laughs> I thought he would just, you know, drop out or uh -huh. get fed up. But he's still at it. He's still oh. driving. And so he has a, a stable life now. And he got married. He's got kids. So things are going good for him. But whenever he needs help, he calls me. Or uh, he wants to switch companies, he'll ask. Have you heard anything bad about this company? So, you know, we always try to support each other. So I've got a question here that kind of goes into where you were talking about having the best view out of the office. This is, what are some of the most memorable places you've picked up or dropped off a load? Let me get to start. Uh, <laughs> good or bad? Good or bad. <laughs> uh, okay. I think one of the most memorable places that I've delivered to was a place that uh, 
made dog food. Uh, and it wasn't because it was nice or pretty, it was because <laughs> of the smell. So I delivered a truckload of dead boar carcasses um, from Texas to uh, North Dakota. It's one of, that place where I picked up is one of only two places that actually processes for me. And it's like this little pasture with a couple of uh, empty trailers that were turned into buildings. And they just stick them in pallets. It's, it's really gross. <laughs> but, um, you know, I couldn't wait to get out of there. But I thought the smell was bad. Bad there was really bad. But then I got to where I was delivering. And, you know, most smells, you can, if you're there long enough, it kind of disappears. You don't notice it. Not this place. <laughs> and, you know, they, they were backed up. Oh. So I had to wait for hours and hours. My clock was, was winding down. And I kept going to him, come on, can we, can we hurry this up? I'm sorry. You know, if you, gotta, if, you, if you run out of hours, you can stay on site. And I was like, no. No, I will go over my hours to get out of this place. I don't care. It, yeah, the smell was bad. <laughs> So that's probably the most memorable place. It sounds happen. pretty memorable. Yeah. Really, how about you? I'm going to go with a good one after that. Thank um, God. I had an entire week that was devoted to a singular company. I picked up uh, raw cherries in Washington and hauled them to northern Vermont, dropped them off at a, uh, a factory up there in a city called St. Albans to be turned into Cherry Garcia ice cream. Oh, okay. Uh, and then my next load, I went down to... Um, I don't remember the exact name of the town, it's like Woodbury, I think, Vermont, uh, the original Ben and Jerry's factory. And that place is tiny, <laughs> I have a 70 foot drop. Um, so that was a challenge, but I got to back in there and they loaded up an entire trailer full of chunky monkey ice cream that I got to take to St. Louis and it was- With a seal on it. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, one of the most, I've never picked up cargo at a tourist trap before. Like, there, was, there was kids everywhere. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Like that's, that factory really does make ice cream. <laughs> and it goes to store shelves, and that's done through companies like us. So that was, that was one of the most memorable places I've been. I bet you debated on whether to actually deliver it or keep it for yourself. I too. was really hoping the forklift driver at the warehouse I delivered to would poke a hole in a box or something by accident. <laughs> <laughs> no luck. No luck. How about you guys? Uh, well, for me, you know, uh, personally, yeah, I do love our window and seeing all the places. But um, I'm a big boy, and I like food. So going to all these places, I have been completely disgusted with the smell of like the potato chip factory or Campbell Soup factory. You go to these places and it, it just stinks. Like it's horrible. It turns your appetite completely different. You know, I'm like, I'm never eating potato chips again. I'm like, the grease is just gross. And like, yeah. So we do like the potatoes to the Lay's factory. Yeah. And it, it was horrible. Like we couldn't even get the smell out of the truck. So I was driving down the, the road and like, I'm like putting the windows down. Like I'm like, you know, it, breaking the Febreze out and like it, you, it, it changes your opinion on a lot on things you, you smell all these smells and but you know you eat it every day you go to Walmart you grab that stuff or Target wherever you're at you know because you load up your truck and you're on the road well I don't eat that stuff now <laughs> uh, I'm currently in the meat industry so therefore I know all the haha foul places to go to <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want rancid aromas. But I'd have to say that one of my greatest is I went to go pick up a load of potatoes up, uh, up in Washington and take it to St. Louis. And just the scenery while I was waiting to get loaded was just amazing. The mountain ranges and everything else and then driving through these passes and it's just, you know, you know there's something, a spirit that guides when you see mm -hmm. this perfection. And, uh, you know, able to literally, you know, just stop on the side of the road and went floating down lava, uh, at Lava Hot Springs. You know, then hop back in the truck and keep going again. Who can do that in their job? Mm -hmm. We get to see some of the most beautiful country and but we also see the worst of it. I think my 
least favorite place to go to is in Logansport, Indiana, oh, which it's a minimum of going to take you about two hours to deal with just the checking in, processing, and getting out. You want to choke the people and run away. <laughs> That's right up the road from where I live. <laughs> uh, so you're, yeah. you're aware. Oh, yeah. So one of the best parts of talking to me is that you get exposed to how the world works, right? Like life is so mediated now. We go to stores and we get stuff off shelves and trucking like gets you to actually interact with where that comes from and participate in it and do work that feels meaningful. But the most interesting load I ever delivered was powdered rust, which I delivered to Nabisco. And I thought, this is odd, and I asked why, and they said, it's that crunch in the Oreos, in the filling. That's powdered rust. Mm. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> but you just kind of find out how stuff works by participating. And it, it is really fun to be a part of. Like potato chips. I went to a place that made potato chips, and uh, I had some of the seasonings in them. And... Uh, you know, they had boxes of stuff, you know, that employees would bunch on. And they were probably sick of it. You know, I, I, my brother worked at a Nestle plant once. And they'll let you eat as much chocolate as you want. Because they know that <laughs> at some point, you'll just go, uh, no more. So they had boxes of potato chips, you know, in the office. And they were like, oh, take as much as you want. Really? <laughs> So I grabbed the box for the kids. And, there you, you know, go. Set it on top. And think about things you learn along the road. You know, like, I don't, I don't think about a lot of things, I guess. You know, I was one of those people before trucking that I really didn't think about the concept of how things get to places. Right, like right. That, you know, so like, you know, you pick up potato chips. Well, there's specific routes. You have to watch your altitude and how high you go up. Yeah. Otherwise, that whole truck right. pops. Like, every one of those bags will pop. Yeah. So there's a specific route you have to follow, or you just bought a lot of things. So on that note, on potato <laughs> chips, I think we're going to wrap up and, and uh, finish this conversation. I, I could sit here and talk for a, a lot longer about all this stuff. So and I really want to thank everybody for being here, Ellie. Well, maybe they've got questions. Excuse me? Maybe they've got questions. Uh, yeah. And uh, d does anybody have a question you want to bring up or no? Wow, you're... Okay, let's, yeah, let's, okay, so we'll just finish it up. Let's okay, mingle. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, so now I'm discombobulated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're just wrapping up. Uh, a really big shout out for uh, Chad, for um, Chad Potter, for uh, making all this happen. And, uh, <laughs> and everybody being here, Ellie, Kira, Anne, Shelly, Bobby and Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him a cookie. Thank you. And Mr. Greg, thank you. Thank you.